Good morning, friends. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Elizabeth Westland. When I, when this epidemic started, I was confined to using the telephone, which was nice enough. It was wonderful just to get the sermon. But by the end of May, I managed to get myself a tablet and I managed to live stream the service, which was wonderful. I must say it was really great to get the service and to hear and see Gordon every week. So I must confess, I did miss the congregation. It's not quite the same as not seeing everybody in the Sunday morning, but hopefully that will come back and we'll get to see one another. I do hope that will be soon, though I must say it's not looking <laughs> like it at the moment. However, when it comes, or until it comes, I wish you all the best and I hope you're all keeping well. The good Lord is looking after you as usual. We're all very fortunate to have such a wonderful Heavenly Father who takes care of us all, even in epidemic. Hello, welcome. This is the service for Claremont Parish Church for Sunday, the 25th of October. And all welcome to join with us in worship. My name's Gordon Palmer, minister here at Claremont. And also taking part in the service this morning, uh, Miriam Murphy will be doing our Bible reading. And the prayers for others will be George Sneddon. George is a student in training for the Church of Scotland ministry. This is his final placement here at Claremont. He's just beginning this week. So he'll be uh, a new face to folk and a new voice. Um, we're delighted that George is uh, with us uh, for the next few months as he, as I say, completes his studies at Glasgow University and also um, has his placement here at, at Claremont. In his first of his uh, letters in the New Testament, the disciple John uh, says this, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We worship a God who is love, who bore our sins at Calvary and then declared and showed the worth, the victory of that as he rose from the dead. And so let's worship such a God as we sing, Come People of the Risen King.
Well, let us pray and we'll gather up our prayers in the words of Jesus that he taught his followers, the Lord's Prayer, the form of the Lord's Prayer that we use. Um, the words for that will be on the screen. Let us come together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we gather as people of the risen King. We gather even though we're in different places and maybe even listening and watching at different times. But through your Holy Spirit, we are brought into unity. Through your Holy Spirit, we have come to see the greatness or something of the greatness of the Jesus, not just dying for us on the cross, but rising from the dead. And might it be, as we have just sung, a delight to bring you praise. We come praising and thanking you for the mercy of God which has reached out to us. We thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And we thank you for the great love that is shown in such a sacrifice for us. Amazing love, how can it be that you should die for me, for us? And we pray, gracious God, that as we gather around your word, we will once more hear not just words of love, but hear and see and be touched and, and feel the intensity of your love for us not least, gracious God, might we know your love made real for us in the forgiveness of sin. For while we acknowledge that you have sacrificed for us, while we acknowledge that you have loved and go on loving, in contrast, our loving, our sacrificing has been all too weak and all too fitful. We don't come because we have given you the praise and honor that you deserve, we haven't. And so we come needing that mercy. We come seeking that forgiveness. And because Christ has died and because Christ has risen, and because we trust in that work of Jesus as Savior and Lord for us, assure us now of forgiveness, of the peace and the pardon that comes in and through Christ. And might your Holy Spirit be with us and help us to faithfully walk in the ways of Jesus, in whose name we pray, and in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Today's Bible reading comes from 2 Corinthians 5, verses 14 to 21. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God, as though God, were making his appeal through us. 
we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen, and may the Lord bless his, the reading of his word. For a while now, we've been following a series on mission-shaped living, based around, or starting from that passage in Luke chapter 10, where Jesus sends his 72 of his followers out two by two to do mission, to share faith, to take the gospel, to announce that the kingdom is near um, to the people around. And we looked at how, firstly, we can go into such a work, such a mission, with a measure of confidence. Jesus says to his followers that the, the, the harvest is ready. It's the, it's the workers that are needed, but the harvest is there. Now, it doesn't mean that every time we seek to do mission, that everything we do for Jesus' sake is going to go well and go easily. And Jesus talked about his followers being persecuted. Now, what Jesus means is that the gospel goes into the world where God is already present and where God is already at work. The church is never commissioned to take something into the world that, that doesn't have a part and doesn't have a place and a use. It's not like we're being um, given the old Betamax uh, videotapes to go and sell around the doors. Nobody, well, hardly anybody uses tapes anymore, but even those that do use VHS and the beta thing's completely redundant. The gospel is not like that. The gospel is not redundant. The gospel is never redundant. There is always a harvest field there. And the thing about the harvest ready for, to be um, brought in is that growth has already been taking place. There's already been work going on. There's already been movement. And, and Jesus promises that we do not go into a world that's completely unprepared. So let us go with a measure of confidence, even though at times it might be hard going. Beyond confidence, the second week we thought about connecting. That when the people of Jesus, his followers, are told and to share faith, it's not as if we're doing that just from a, a safe distance. We're not dropping bombs of the gospel on people or firing lightning bolts. We're getting alongside people. Now, we mustn't limit the work of God, and there are times and occasions when um, God reaches out, always without any other human connection of, at all, and, and, and touches some's life, somebody's life and brings changes. But on the whole, in the main, the pattern is that of, of Jesus who moved in, Jesus who took on flesh, Jesus who came alongside and so can making connections are really important. And in the third way, last week we were looking at the theme of continuing. That evangelism and discipleship are not things to be kept apart, but brought together. And we saw in the missionary work of the Apostle Paul how he didn't just start churches, but how he stayed with folks, how he encouraged them, how he gave them the basics of, of the faith. And we're moving on this week to look at the theme then of compassion. So we have confidence, God is at work, connecting, building on the connections with continuing, and this week, compassion. And in Luke chapter 10, at verses 8 and 9, the pattern is, is spelt out about how the followers of Jesus were to, to love and be with and serve those that they went to. This is the motivation for mission. And perhaps the best known verse of the New Testament in John chapter 3, verse 16, we're told, we're told God so loved the world that he sent his son. A few weeks ago, we were looking at um, the end of Matthew chapter 9 and how Jesus, we're told, when he looked on the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep. They were like sheep without a shepherd. It was compassion that moved Jesus to speak to the crowds, to share the good news. It was love that made the Father send the Son into the world and enabled the Son to come into the world. And these and, and many other passages of the New Testament should make it easy or clear that, that love is, is a basis or the basis for Christian mission. But unfortunately, in the story of the church, that's not always been the case. Quite often, sharing faith had been 
tied up by, sometimes with colonization. The church and the state had got together. They went into other countries and conquered in battle. And it was almost as if they took the beaten army all bloodied and muddied by the war and, and kind of hosed them all down and then said, well, that's you lot baptized now. You're all Christians. But Chris, because Christianity was going to be imposed by the, the warring victors. That happened. Sometimes it was commerce. And so in the missionary expansion in the 19th century in particular, 18th into 19th century, it was quite often the, the tie-up of business going into different lands, the Far East India Company and taking the missionaries, but, but so that they could build their economic empire, so they could do economic exploitation, and the church was party to that. And then sometimes mission has been done, more, sometimes are thought about as a spirit of competition. Um, I remember someone in a, one of my previous charges saying to me, we've got to get folks together, get them into the church, because otherwise the Roman Catholics will, will take over. And again, sometimes the message that's been presented, or at least the message that's been heard, has been, we want you to come and, and join us too. This is a good thing that we've got going, and you probably like it too, and hey, we want it to continue. Now, none of them, colonization or commerce or competition or come and join our, our wee group, none of them flow out of love. Now last week in the passage in Acts chapter 20, we read how the Apostle Paul could say to the, the church in Ephesus, to the Ephesian leaders, that he had been open with them, he had served them, he hadn't exploited them, he hadn't done mission out of any ulterior motive. He wasn't setting up tent making as some cottage industry to make a profit or trying to curry favor with anyone. It was simply the warm-hearted love of Jesus which had reached out and reached down to Paul. And it's to be the same for us. It's the love of Christ, which is to control us. Verse 14 of 2 Corinthians 5. Mission is to be done with compassion in and out of love and has have nothing with, to do with ulterior motives. And we are to see, Paul says in verse 16 and following of the, the passage that Miriam read, we're to see things in and through Christ, not in a worldly way anymore, but with new eyes, Jesus' eyes. Now, what does that involve? I mean, it means that we don't see people as uh, more or less important. We don't curry to the, give favor to the, the wealthy or people who have got status. We don't respect those that we think are worthy and not bother with the rest. We don't just hang out with those who are the same type as us. We don't think that there's decent people and then not decent people. And then there's other ways, other worldly ways that I think people look around and, and, and decide who they're going to respect and admire. Um, honor amongst thieves, and some people respect those who cheat and, and get away with it. Some only respect those who identify with their cause, and there are plenty of causes out there. These are the good guys, and the others are the bad guys. But none of that is sharing God's perspective. None of that is seeing people in and through Christ. And when we see people in and through Christ, we see verse 18 and following that a key thing, the most important thing, is about reconciliation. Paul writes about how that God has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and now we have this ministry of reconciliation because that's the basic thing about all people. No matter how rich or how poor, no matter how worthy or unworthy, no matter whether they're going to vote this way or that way, whether they support this team or that team, whether they're, they seem to us good guys or not, all of us need to be reconciled to God. Now, reconciliation implies a breakdown, does it not, of, of a relationship. You don't reconcile people who are already good friends. You don't reconcile people with others that they don't know. Um, there was a new minister inducted into Boswell um, just uh, very recently last week, and I don't need to be reconciled with the guy because I've never met him. It would be a nonsense to talk about reconciliation. We might talk about the importance of getting to know someone, or, but reconciliation is where there has been a problem, where there has been a breakdown. And so just as cure supposes an illness, just as solution supposes a problem, so reconciliation supposes a broken relationship. 
And this is what Paul is saying in these verses, that this message of the gospel is for all people and they need to be reconciled. But why? Why this call, verse 20, for us to be reconciled to God? What's the breakdown? Is it our feelings towards God? Is it a feeling that maybe God hasn't done his job properly? He hasn't stopped suffering. He hasn't prevented this happening. If, if God was around and doing his work, then I, I wouldn't have such and such to put up with. And, and so therefore we have some kind of distance from God, feel a bit unhappy with him. Is it, is it the putting aside of that stuff that the apostle means? Well, clearly not, because he'd said, verse 18, that this reconciliation is something that has been done. God has reconciled, past tense, us to himself. And so if it was about my feelings towards God, my unhappiness with him, my thinking he's not done well enough or he's not done his job or anything like that, then Paul couldn't speak about that having taken place in the past. Besides, verse 18 makes it clear it's God who does it. And in verses 19 and verse 21, he makes it clear that what he's talking about is a reconciliation because sin is being dealt with. Now, here is one of the huge problems of our era, that we don't much talk about sin and we don't recognize sin. Someone who is... Um, a heavy smoker um, doesn't necessarily notice the smell and the taste of tobacco, but when a non-smoker is with them, they certainly do. Non-smokers pick it up and other people's clothes and furniture and, and, and so on, because they're not used to that. Whereas the heavy smoker, well, it's, it's, it's around them all the time. And so they've been kind of desensitized. Now, in the same way, we've, we've become desensitized to sin. We've not, like, we've not acknowledged that things are sin. But God is clear about sin. Sin is not just murder and sin is not just big theft. Sin is laziness and pride and jealousy. Sin is when we don't do enough to help others. Sin is indifference to the poor and the suffering. Sin is just turning a blind eye. Sin is wanting to have the last word in every conversation. Sin is when we kind of tell the half-truth to put ourselves in a good light, and so on and so on. And the thing is that a holy and a good God cannot be indifferent to this. And in, the, and in those terms, none of us is perfect. And as Romans 3.23 reminds us, all of us have sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And the gospel is not that God's going to sweep that under the carpet or that he's going to be indifferent to it, but rather he deals with it. Verse 21, God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so some people might say, God is love, therefore he will not punish sin. The gospel says, God is love, therefore he did punish it and punished it in Christ. But the gospel is also clear, verse 20, that there's a response that's called for, which is why Paul is saying as an ambassador for Christ, he's making his appeal to people, imploring them, be reconciled to God. Now, if somebody today was to develop the vaccine that was going to cure us instantly of COVID-19, what would be the loving thing to do? Would the loving thing be just to say, great, now I've got that and make sure that I get it, my pals get it, my family get it? Surely the loving thing would be to try and make this vaccine as, as available, as, as widespread as possible. It wouldn't be loving just to put an advert in the newspaper and say, well, if people choose a different newspaper, that's just their problem. It wouldn't be enough just to maybe put one notice in, in a radio program and say, too bad if you don't listen to the radio, or too bad if you're not in a, an area of the world where that program's broadcast, or too bad if you can't speak the language and didn't pick it up. 
No, the loving response is to do everything we can to get that news out there. We've got something that can make a difference. We've got something that's secure. We've got something that's going to change and transform the situation we're in. And that's the basic claim of the gospel. That in Christ we're changed, in Christ we're transformed, we're in a different situation. We are no longer under the judgment of God for his sin, but we are now in the place where we have, verse 21, the righteousness of Christ given to us. And it's a reconciliation. It's a, a patching up. It's a repair job between the holy God and, and us men and women who are sinners. And the loving thing is to get that good news out. The loving thing is to, is to share. People can be reconciled to God, and without that recon reconciliation, they're still in a position of, of estrangement from God, of damnation. But, but here is a gospel that says, here's good news. Now, in the, this month of October here in Claremont, we've been encouraging folks to pray for friends, for family members who are, who are not yet Christians, praying and asking God to give us opportunities to share our faith. We provided two, our introduction to the Christian faith series, Come and See, we provided that to folks to say, have a look at that. Maybe you could use that. Maybe sit down and, and take someone through the gospel. Why? Because we need Claremont to survive? No. Why? Because we want to be better than a, another church down the road? No. But because the loving thing is to say, we have something that's good news, and we want you to have it too. It would be monstrous if someone had developed a vaccine for COVID-19 and then just kept that information hidden. It'd be monstrous if they left the rest of the world to be hurting and suffering. It's just as monstrous to keep quiet about Jesus. For this is the most loving thing that we can do for someone. Do they have a vast fortune? Well, they won't be able to take it with them. Our best thing we can do for our family is not to make sure that they get a, a big inheritance from us because, well, that will help in lots of ways, but they're not going to be able to take that with them. It's not going to sort them out eternally. The best thing we can do for someone is not provide them um, access to a, to a job that's a fulfilling career because, well, that will help in lots of ways, but that's not going to be ultimately all their life's about. There's an eternal dimension that is not something that we automatically assume after this, but which is only found in, in fulfillment and being brought into fellowship with the living God through being reconciled to him. So then let's join with the Apostle Paul in being ambassadors. Not because God needs a recruitment drive, but because here is a loving thing to do. The harvest is ready, said Jesus. We just need laborers. We need folks to connect with others, to continue to minister and, and be alongside, and who have the compassion to say, even though somebody's not queuing up to hear about it, even though somebody's not um, ready, we will think, we will pray, and we will seek to look for the opportunities to say, you know, the best thing I can do to you, the, for you, it's to have Christ, to share Jesus. Love says, be reconciled to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for you sorting out the issue, you sorting out the problem and sending your son to die for our sin. We thank you that it was because of love that you did that to us and for us. And so, gracious God, help us to know more and understand better and receive more fully the great love of God that is offered for us in Christ, 
Help us to know more of the worth of what it is to be reconciled, to be in fellowship with, to be one with the Lord God. And help us not to forget that good news, but to be willing to share it. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we're going to sing in just a moment about the love of God. Here is love. After we've sung the hymn, they confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And then George is going to be leading us in our prayers for others. Here is the vastness of God's love. Here is love, vast as the ocean. I believe in God the Father. As you may know, the scriptures compel us as the church to pray regularly for others. So let's bring together those prayers for those we know and those we don't. Let's pray. Father God, as Christ's love compels us to do, we come before your throne of grace, bringing the needs of those we know and those we don't. As our faces differ, so do each of our needs, and yet we know that you are there to satisfy and meet them all. We recognise how you gave your Son, regardless of the cost, that he gave his life for the life of the world. And so, Lord, we pray for those who seek to love you in return however imperfect, however uncertain, however unsure that love might be. We think of those who are new in their faith, who are perhaps on a journey, who are still learning and knowing the ways that you have worked in their lives. And we pray that you keep their, their love and their intrigue ever growing. We pray, Lord, for those two who have had a faith for a long time, they might never become complacent or stale or ever fall into a routine. Keep their love for you fresh. In times of trial and darkness, times like this pandemic that we are in, Lord, 
who bring before you those whose faith has crumpled. Those who have struggled to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Those who have forgotten what it means to walk with you. Lord, my prayer is that you renew their love for you. Lord, also I pray for those who have no faith. Those who don't know you or seek you. Or who aren't inspired by the words of your mouth. Kindle a love for them, O God, in their hearts. And Father, we pray also for those whose faith is costly. Those who have given up their time and their money and their experience and their knowledge and their energy and their security for the purposes of the church. We pray too also for those who have given up their lives to be, as we heard today, ambassadors for Christ. Father God, reward their love. Lord, I pray too for those who need something in these times to put their faith in. Remember especially the poor and the homeless and the hungry. Those who are going through turmoil or broken relationships. Those who are sick or suffering and those who are dealing with loss. May they experience the fullness of your reconciling love. Lord, your love is for all. May it reach out through your people into every heart and every space. And may you give us the responsibility to be part of that. Learning to love in new ways as you first loved us. This we pray in your son's precious name. Just before we sing our closing praise, I have a few notices. Um, firstly, in terms of bad news, they um, announced the death of one of our members during the week, Beryl Dixon. Beryl had been staying the last 18 months or so in the nursing home at, at Lindsayfield. Um, we still do not yet, as we're recording this, at least have time and information of details for a funeral service, but we'll be wanting to let folks know of that as, as soon as we can. In terms of some good news, we were delighted to hear during the week that our ministry, previous ministry assistant, Ali Scott, who was with us for a few years until March, Ali was this week um, elected to be the new minister at Lark Hall Baptist Church. It was a very affirming and convincing vote, and Ali and Fiona are absolutely delighted about that. Ali will be starting work there very soon, next week in fact, and uh, at some, again at some stage there will be an induction service um, organised and we'll let folks know information about that when we have it. I had said then uh, um, midweek that we were hoping to do a uh, Claremont calling um, on Friday past there. Um, we didn't manage to do that, but that was partly because the course that we were wanting to um, publicize, the Scripture Union-led Bible Alive course, um, is already fully, fully subscribed. Um, but we'll be coming back to that issue um, just as soon as we can, and we'll be restarting Claremont calling um, next Friday. This is the last uh, Sunday of the month, and so there's a congregational prayer meeting after the service. We'll be gathering for about half an hour or so and be doing that at 12 o'clock. The um, contact uh, link for that is in the YouTube uh, uh, details um, beneath the recording of this, and also it's been on the uh, Midweek Messenger, and we would like as many folks as possible to be able to uh, join with us and support the church in that work. Finally, again, to encourage you to be thinking and praying and sharing about faith, as I say, we sent materials out to come and see with the intention that they get used. If we're not prepared to speak to our family and friends about Jesus and say why he's worth following and, and explain about that reconciliation to God, it raises one of two questions. One, do we really love them? Because if we love our family and friends, we will want them to have what's best for them. Or secondly, the question, 
do we really believe the gospel is true? Because if we don't believe that some, what someone most needs is Jesus, then it's the gospel that we're calling into question. So if we love, and if we believe what we say we believe, and for example, confessed in the Apostles' Creed, we will be going on looking for opportunities, wanting chances to share that good news, to follow Jesus. That call to follow Jesus is not something that um, we do by just sitting back and not doing anything, but by, get, by giving who we are and what we can to the cause of Christ. Sometimes that will involve us in a, in a caring and in a serving work that was hard. Jesus himself modeled that for us. And so we pick up that theme in our closing praise, will you come and follow me? Now may the grace of the Lord.